Hey there, Product Launch Hazards. Welcome to another Office Hour expert introduction. And today I'm really excited because your, your introduction is to another hazard. This is my sister-in-law, Lara Hazard, and she is an expert in market research. And why I'm so excited is because I promised you that we were going to protect you from the other hazards of uh, product launching. And I think that's so critical to that is the market research hazard. Like, do people want to buy what you have to sell? Are they going to, are they going to respond to it? What features should be in this? It's like, you know, what do they value? Like all of these questions come up in your mind and market research is a great way to answer that. And so I'm not only excited that you have a, uh, you know, that you're here and then being able to listen to this important topic, but you have a hazard who's going to help you to go through it. So I'm really excited about that. She is married to my little brother. <laughs> That's who I consider him because he was four when I met him. And so anyway, I want you to listen to her because she is brilliant and she has this great background and expertise with very, very big brands. And big brands make a lot of mistakes. If you've heard me speak before, they make tons of mistakes and they still do this stuff. <laughs> and so when you're not doing it, you have an even greater risk for making mistakes. So this is why she's going to be such a critical expert for you to tune into and ask great questions and, and utilize her service services and things like that. So I want, I'm going to have her rather than me read her bio, which sounds a little like nepotism, but it, it is, I'm so proud of her. So um, I'm going to have her tell you a little bit about how she got started in market research, came right out of college and, and went into it and, and the kind of clients she's worked with and the brands she's worked with because it's going to astound you. Thank so you. hey, Laura. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Yay. Thank I'm so glad we're finally doing this. So please yes. tell us about how you got started in market research. Definitely. Okay. So I am a Midwestern girl, grew up in Ohio. I went to school at Indiana University. I studied marketing and I opted to go the research route. I am a curious girl. That's just sort of kind of nerdy too. Ingrained you in like to I ask am. questions. Yeah. I love to ask questions. I'm not afraid to ask questions. Um, so that's why I went the consumer research route. So since college, I moved to Los Angeles, met Chris, your, that's your right. brother-in-law. And, um, but I've been working for consulting firms in Los Angeles ever since then. So um, big brands were my clients. I worked with Target, Starbucks, Disney, Fox, Sony. Um, the products I've worked on really range. I've done everything from plus size women's apparel to um, kitten cat food and everything <laughs> and in between. Foods and fashion yes. and like all kinds of Rush product meat, areas. Bakery, electronics, bath and body, perfumes, things like that. Um, I've sort of worked the gamut. I mean, these big brands, when you're working with your mass merchandisers, they sell a lot of different types. So I have worked across, across it all. <laughs> Well, and I think this is really important because, you know, um, you know, what goes on at mass market is really, um, it's hard. And a lot of them have what we, I call very frequently the shotgun approach. There's like, <laughs> let's just throw it out there and see if it happens. But you know what? It's not cost effective for big brands to do that. And that's why they dive deep into market research. That's why they have a process for test marketing. So they also, they don't even tech, take what people say. They then test yeah. run it and see if people will buy it. And so having a process yourself is so critically important when you're a small business, you're an inventor, you're an Amazon seller, you're, you know, e-commerce seller in general, and you've got very limited bandwidth to make a mistake. Absolutely, so yeah. that's, you know, why it's more and more critical to ask the important questions. And so when we've talked before, and you know, I'm a little more in the know than most people. So I want to do a little bit of deep dive on some of the definitions of things you're, you're going to say over time. And yeah. uh, cause that's my job to demystify what's going on with market research. Yeah. And so, you know, I know you throw out some terms called qual and quant, and I hear it all the time from other people in the industry and in big brands and in the know, but what does that mean? Okay, so both are important. So don't let anyone tell you one is more important than the other. Quant. <laughs> Quant is your data. It's your numbers. It's your return on investment. It tells you you can size the market. It gives you something to grip onto and benchmarks. It's a starting point. Um, it's really important for brand health. It gives you, it's data. It's talking to people and it's talking to a lot of people, at least 500. Um, and so that, that's a, that's a statistical size that works. It's, I mean, you can go a little lower, but it's what I feel most confident in. We've done, you know, it all depends on 
lots of things as most things in product launching everything has a story and a different nuance but 500 is where i feel comfortable it's representative we want to hear from every age every ethnicity income group your different cities in the country or in the world you know start with 500 it's statistical and it's like you can extrapolate from there um so that's your data side and that's usually done with something as easy as an online survey and it's just typing in, you know, a lot of this, maybe you've uh, had a touch point here with political polling. That's your data. That's an example. Um, or your satisfaction, you go to Best Buy and they say, hey, take this survey, give us a one through 10. That's quant in a very kind of basic way, but just to kind of put in perspective. Um, qual on the other side is just as important. So this is the people, the feelings, the emotions, the stories. So you can't necessarily make a, um, a judgment call on qual alone, just like you wouldn't make one on quant alone. So qual is your focus group where everyone sits around the table and you have a moderator and you ask questions. It's also in-depth interviews or even observations. Sometimes you have to stand in the Target store and watch people shop the aisle. And oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, I know you've done this. I do it. Um, I do it all the time. Yeah. And it's, that's qual. So we can all say, how satisfied are you with the product? One through five. And if I give you a four, well, how do we improve? What does that mean? You know, qual tells us the why. Here's mm -hmm. a little bit more. Here's the consumer voice. And this also helps for marketing messaging. So how does your client or your prospective buyer talk about your widget? Well, we'll right, because <laughs> this is this is what happens. We talk about this all the time on my shows. You get caught up in your what, right? The mm -hmm. thing that you invented, the, the the what you sell. You're in the know on it. You have industry terminology. You yes. have shorthand. You have like you know you you call it these things. Um, but that doesn't mean the consumer perceives it that way and that's not the terms they use. And so that's where your messaging can really go wrong in that you think, hey, I've got the best thing here, but if it's not communicating to them, if they're not perceiving it. And so I, I use this term, I'm wondering how, what you think of it, is my definition of brand is, is that while it's not what you say you are, it's how people perceive that you are. Absolutely. Definitely. I would say that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And so you got to check it, right? Yeah. Well, ultimately, it doesn't matter what you think about your product because you're not going to make money doing that way. Like, it matters. <laughs> you're not going to buy it day, no. day in and day out yourself. No. I mean, listen, if it's a passion project, that's totally different. But if you want to make money, if you want to grow a brand and really make something, it matters what other people think about you and yeah. the product. Ah, oh, so glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about what that looks like, though, in practice. So, I mean, I, I know don't, a lot of inventors, a lot of designers out there, they get all really upset about the term focus group. Yeah. Because they mm -hmm. see focus groups as being not innovating, not getting it, mm -hmm. not happening. And so that's where they have this sort of like, I don't know, um, dissatisfaction and say, no, I don't, I'm not interested in market research because that's the only thing that they know. Yeah. So... Focus groups can be old school. I mean, there's like SNL spoofs about focus groups. Um, they've changed a lot. And I think it also, it just comes down to the moderator and the questions you're asking um, and how you are including everyone. And consumers are not dumb. I mean, that's, if anyone who's done even a little bit of research knows consumers not dumb and they are creative thinkers we will screen for that to make sure they're articulate and can are thoughtful and emotional, but they can absolutely be, be creative. And I have seen some incredible ideas come out of focus groups that I have designers in the back room saying, Oh my gosh, I never thought of that because they're in their own right. little world, their own little box. So. so, so here's kind of my guidelines that I like, I like to do focus groups earlier rather than later. Mm -hmm. So this is why I think it gets a bad name is that that sort of old school style of focus group that you're referring to is this, like, we've got, we've got this widget and yeah. it's going to market. Now, let, you know, someone at the top goes, oh, wait a minute, what did the focus group say of it? And mm -hmm. they were like, oh, well, we skipped that part. And so now you've yeah. like gone so far down the road and then the focus group says something negative and they're all like, it's too late. Like in, you know, yeah. they're wrong. And like, yeah. it gets to be this war instead of if you do it really early on, you can design into it. And mm -hmm. so that's where I like to be. 
Totally. And with that, I think, you know, at the very, very, very early stage, even just doing a small group, a group of moms in a living room. I mean, focus groups have really changed. We meet at coffee shops, we meet in homes, we meet at different places that are inspiring. Start there and you'll have your answers. You'll have big answers and aha moments from the very early phase. And if it falls flat there, there's a lot of work to be done before you go into prototyping and further into distribution and all of that. Yeah. So there are lots of different ways to approach that. But the number one thing that I always say is that you shouldn't ask your own questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tell us why that is from a, from a, a making market research significant yeah. and important. Tell me why that is. Well, I mean, it's, it also is why, you know, big companies like Disney have outsiders write their questions for them too. I mean, and these are really smart Harvard MBA people that don't even ask their own questions about their own products. The reason is because you're biased. You love it. You've been living and breathing it. Sometimes your job is staked on it, your livelihood, your family, the food on your table. You want it to succeed. And, you know, when you write your own questions, first, you're going to have a bias. You may forget about some of the criticisms that could be coming up. Um, And you also might be missing something, especially if you're not totally um, ingrained in the industry yet. If it's new and you're still learning, you might not know all the questions to ask. You might miss something. And, you know, especially when you have a conversation, you can take so many different tangents. And, you know, as a moderator, um, because I do moderate a lot of my own focus groups, sometimes tangents are bad, but sometimes they're really powerful. Yeah. So you know when to stop it and when to move on. Yeah. This is just uh, droning on here. Let me fix that. (laughs) So, you know, that's really interesting. So, you know, we, we, we're actually working with you, you on, on it for part of our business and sort of doing a, um, I'm like, I'm going to call it a customer satisfaction survey, but at the same time, it also is getting a better understanding of why they chose to work with us. And that is something like, we think we know why. But is it true? And so sometimes you need that validation to understand is, is it the way we said it? Is it the way it's happening? Is it, you know, let's validate that in the process because we might be able to design better market materials. We might be able to design better products, services, whatever that might be around that if we understand those things. Yeah. And, you know, the way you phrase a question could give you totally different different answers. That's what I was just thinking. Cause you know, your niece Linnea, right? So she's, <laughs> love her. she's almost nine. And, and I went to her school for back to school, you know, for the, like, I wouldn't say it was a report card cause it wasn't a reporting period, but it was yeah. kind of like that parent teacher conference idea. Yeah. And so she said, well, you know, I know Linnea reads really well. Um, but she doesn't seem to ha- you know, do as well on reading comprehension. And I said, is it because she's not answering the questions or she's answering them wrong? Or is she just answering them in a different way than you imagined? And she goes, yeah, she's kind of creatively answering them. And I said, I don't think it's because she's misunderstanding the question. Her perception is though, that that question means something else. Yes. And that's what happens a lot when we, when we pick our own questions. It's like, we're in this like, okay, we're an adult and we're choosing these questions for a reading comprehension and we think they're at a kid's level, mm-hmm. but not a creative and innovative kid like my daughter. Who's yeah. Gonna go, yeah, you don't mean that. <laughs> well, and I think that's a great point. Different ages perceive things differently, different groups, depending on where you are in the country. You know, if you're designing something for a teenager and you're 50 years old, you may not know how to ask the question properly, or you might be not thinking about another piece in the context of their world. I mean, that's why we do both quant and qual because we want a representation of everyone and every thought process. Like this is America. There are all different ways we construe questions, but you know, you want to keep things basic and open and um, have a, have a direction as well. You know, this is an interesting kind of area because it also comes to what I'm going to call it bias in the data. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of bias in our data. I mean, I think it's becoming more and more clear as we Mm -hmm. move into an artificial intelligence and AI world at which the data is very important. And if the data is already skewed and biased to begin with, then do we need to have 
the qual to kind of offset it and validate it and question it. And so that's really where I come into the world saying, hmm, that data is interesting. Yeah. But is it reflective? So this happened. Question really, everything. Yeah, question everything, right? And so I was writing an article. It was a really interesting um, uh, research report that was put out. It was about maybe a year and a half ago on brand perception. Mm-hmm. and how there's this gap between how big brands perceive themselves. So Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, um, a Target, right? Mm-hmm. All of those level of brands and they perceive themselves and what their executives and organization think of themselves as what the, you know, how they rank in the industry or how they, you know, how cons- what consumers think of them. And so they have this rating scale that they utilized and then they did that with consumers and so wanted to assess the gap between the perception that the internal has and and the gap that the external has pointing out this perception issue Mm -hmm. and so there was this really like significant gap between how highly rated it was internally and how you know was like i would say probably at least a a 35 to 40 percent differential lower Wow. across every one of the different ways that which you were perceiving it, like perceiving their service, perceiving their quality, perceiving their product line. Like it was yep. a perception in all the categories and they were always different, like that much lower than how they thought of them themselves. Wow. And so I asked the researcher <laughs> and he was really like excited about it. He was really proud of it. It was really statistically like it was a big research. I mean, it was not small at thousands. all. Yeah. yeah, it was thousands. And so, yeah. and I said to him, do you think, and this was just my last question, do you think that the, that the difference is, is that, you know, consumers are made up of 86% or more women and um, the executive, I, we know from all the surveys of retail and, and big consumer brand executives that the mix is, you know, very, very low and that they have a very small percentage of women there. Do you think there's a perception gap because of that? Did you filter out for gender? And he went, no, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. And he yeah, never did. Gotta weigh that data. Right. Got to weigh that data. And so it was a bias in how they took the data too, yeah. because mm-hmm. you, they didn't screen out for that because I guarantee you when they did the survey and they said, oh, we surveyed a thousand executives. That's great. But did, were you not matched with the number, with the same gender for? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, anytime you're doing benchmarking, Um, from the beginning, you have to know the context of everything. And, you know, just, you know, for that example, when you're looking at corporate employees to consumers, you need to make sure you understand the context is the same. And same goes with when you're looking across brands or looking at your competitors or comparing the different regions, all of that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah. There has to be kind of like balances that happen in that yeah. or, or shifting of it and, and, yeah. and, and uh, massaging the data a little bit, and, but then confirming it, right? Well, is and this that's, true? And this is like such an important piece to research as well is the gut check is you are an expert in this product, right? I am not like, if I am your moderator, I'm not, I'm not the expert you are. And so there's always that piece after we talk to everyone, collect the data. Does it make sense? Does it, does it pass your gut check? Is it what we thought? We always go into every research study with an idea of what the results will be. You need to kind of know where like you're Like have headed. a hypothesis? Have a hypothesis, absolutely. And what story do you think we're going to tell? And listen, if it's totally different, that's an interesting finding. But you have to ask why then. There's more red flags. So it's always good to kind of have a, a gut check. Yeah. Is this right? Or is there an error? I mean, that happens too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that that is so, so true. So, you know, one of the um, episodes that is going to be coming up is what I call the, which is the 80-20 color roll, right? Mm-hmm. So you have uh, 80% of your volume come from 20% of your colors. It's the same thing with any yep. product line, right? I mean, this yep. is, it, it, yeah. Anyway, it's, but the issue is, is that what happens when you remove the rest of the line of the colors and you only put out those 20 percent your context changes and that's really problematic so if you're going to if you're thinking about doing something like that in variables you this is something to communicate to your research team about because if if it works in one in one scenario but then you remove all of those pieces Mm -hmm. does it still work that's always a good good question to ask so one of the the ongoing things that i like to do is 
um, I clean up people's product lines all the time. So like sometimes yeah. they get to thousands of SKUs and they're like panicked too about many. it. Yeah. Right. Too many about it. And so I have a good experience to know which ones, if you pull them out, the whole thing isn't going to tumble down. Yep. But I still like to have that gut checked. And so when we think that, and when they say, gosh, this one is so important and, you know, you can't take this one away. And I'm be like, but it's draining your bottom line. <laughs> like, yeah, are you sure? Right. And mm -hmm. so that's the time where you should go in and you say, so if you're gut as the person that like we built our foundation of our business on this, let's mm -hmm. confirm that it's not just because your heartstrings were in it and it was your baby and it was the first one. Let's mm -hmm. confirm that that's really the perception of the community that you're serving. And if it's not, and it's hurting your bottom line and, yeah. it's, and it's draining your resources and adding complexity, these are the kinds of things that you want to check. So there's more than just launching a product that you may yeah, want to use research for. I mean, it's a constant, we, it's a movie, it's a moving target. We have a, a checkpoint in time is when we do the research and report out. But as soon as we hit that report and hit send, it changes, especially yeah. if your demo is younger. I mean, that changes every couple months. <laughs> Um, every yeah. age, every age is different. I've done a ton of generational, uh, research and every three years or so you have a different little human and the way they think about and interact, but it's always important to refocus every year, at least let's just check in again, have a pulse on what's happening, um, to make sure you're not missing something. I mean, yeah. time goes by your competitors are coming in. Yeah. Gotta know about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's different. So, you know, this is a, one of the things, so people ask me all the time, well, what, what kind of market research services do you offer? And I support market research services, but actually if you want to know, like, I'm just going to subcontract to Laura. So you're going to get her anyway. So you might as well go direct to her if you don't need me. So I'm just, that's where, that's what's going on behind the scenes here. But we do three types that we really recommend for, um, for, I'm going to call it, startup brands. Mm -hmm. So for, if you're a new brand, if you've got some new, new products going in, we recommend three things. And then we recommend a different set of things. If you're an established brand that's growing though, you're on a fast growth or in a fast growth industry. And I'll talk about the second, but the first three that we do is like, we really want to make sure that you've tested that people will actually buy whatever it is. So whatever questions you're going to ask, however you're going to do it, whatever the most low cost way is, we need to test buying of something, not whether or not somebody likes it. Yes. Like is only <laughs> likes great. <laughs> yeah. But will they plunk down money because you need to build a sustainable brand? Yeah. So it's really, so everything centers around trying to get those answers as early as possible. And what are the key features to make that buy happen? Mm -hmm. So if we need to ask those early on, then we do that. So th that's where all the research we, we do in the initial stages uh, circulate around testing that out. And sometimes that's focus groups. Sometimes it's just, we don't have a prototype. We don't have a product to show anyone. We can't ask some questions yet. So we just need to ask them around the idea. So yes. that's where we survey. You know, survey, host a host a little, you know, kind of very targeted market survey though. So we're always yes. really specific. Then the second thing we test is like, let's say we do already have a product that's pretty refined and decent on our idea. And we feel pretty strongly that we've gotten good indicators along the way. Now we want to make sure that we're focusing on the biggest right market. So mm -hmm. like, you know, is this just moms of preschoolers or is this like grandparents, you know, like we want to make sure that we understand who? that who, it, and, and we have this idea that lots of people go into it saying, oh, everybody will buy it. Like everybody needs it. And I can tell you right now, that's not going to, can it, you cannot spend the money to buy the budget. Yeah. You don't have the budget to get everybody mm -hmm. to see it. To buy it. So if you're going to focus your dollars and be focused, let's go with the market that is most likely to buy it first. And yeah. so dialing in and finding that, that's our second thing that we really try to do. What do you think of that process so far? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Totally. And then I'm, the I'm third, <laughs> yeah. And then the third piece that we do is we include some kind of survey, I'm going to call it a customer satisfaction, registry card, like warranty card, if that's what you've got in your thing. And we want to make sure that we add really good questions to them or, or post-purchase survey, if you just email it, whatever that might want to be. We like to dial in questions around that um, once we get out of the testing phase of it. We don't, you know, mm -hmm. testing, we're usually like, we'll pick up the phone and ask people because we know the handful of people who bought it. But, but beyond that, we want to do something that's a little more ongoing so ongoing. that we can maybe track over time 
our answers starting to change? Are they the same? Are they different? And, but getting good questions is a really critical part of that. So that's Absolutely. where we would utilize someone like you to put in. And that's actually what we're working on right now is setting in those initial set of questions that happens with every client we bring in. Definitely. And, yeah. and listen, I know I threw out the 500 earlier, but 10 is better than zero. If you know, we reach, we reach for the stars and see 10 who are not your friends and family. Yes. <laughs> 10 honest people that aren't going to care if they hurt your feelings, but, um, 10 but yeah. people who plunk down money, like really even better because they obviously made a money. purchase decision. Right. So yes. yes, definitely. Yeah. I think all of that is right on. I mean, you're yeah. still in the early phases getting some type of data, you know, if you, it's only 10 people that's considered qualitative, but like I said earlier, still very important. It's still, still very useful and impactful. Yeah. So then if we move on to people who are growing brands, so let's say they already are in a really great niche and I'm going to use, because you mentioned Starbucks before, they're in the coffee niche. Yep. So, okay. Like, cause we all know, we all know coffee and tea. Yep. This is easy, right? So we easy. can talk about that. Everybody, you know, everybody kind of gets that idea. So, so we're already in this niche. We already have market. We already have people buying our product, whatever it is around coffee. Right. And so now we're in that and now we want to really, okay, are we getting useful data? Are people filling out the warranty card or whatever that might be? you know, that our survey is, is plugging away. Is that survey still serving us? Let's refine that. Then mm -hmm. the second thing we do is we do a much more uh, concerted market study. And so that's where we study the competitors. What are they doing? What are the features? What are they, you know, what are they saying about their products? What are their price points? Like we do a, and when we do a product within a marketplace, we're really going like looking online and on the shelf. Because yeah. it's an indicator when something hits the shelf, it's an indicator that it sold better and it's, it's, it's in that 20% that's do, doing 80% of the volume. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend the money putting it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So we watch that and we see that, but it's no good if we do it as just a snapshot. For a big brand, we watch it over time. Yep. Because Absolutely. micro trends happen, seasonal trends happen. And overall, though, we want to see if the market is shifting into a particular perception and things, and we want to be aware of it rather than following a trend that isn't you really there. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be the we want to be, yeah. Mm -hmm. We want to be ahead of the, the things that are important, but not at the things that aren't. So then when we see these micro trends or see stuff happening, now we take that, we design into it something that's representative, and we go out there and we do a good focus group and market research and validate is this really a like flash in the pan and by the time I get this to market, it's going to be gone? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that, hey, it's tapping into an opportunity gap that people are starting to merge on and, and that's where we start to find ways to stay innovative or grow yep. our product line more, more um, in a smart way that serves the consumers we have and will grow that base of consumers. Yeah, definitely. I mean, people get bored now. I mean, it's not... <laughs> things are changing. And as much as they love your product, A, to start, they're excited about the next one or the, the new finish or the new color, whatever is going to be different. I mean, people get bored very quickly. Yeah. Um, loyalty to products specifically is hard to get. Brands, you can get and you can hold, I mean, let's look at Apple. Those loyal Apple buyers, you got them for the rest of your life. But, um, Product loyalty is a little bit harder than brand. So I like your point, yeah. especially if we're adding colors or adding other products, we need to know a little bit more and we need to stay current. So everyone yeah. stays excited about what's coming out. Right. And it is that, you know, if you're getting stale and getting old already mm -hmm. and, and you're like, and that couldn't happen in 18 months. It like can. it's not like it's, you know, it can happen in a year happen nowadays. In a yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, and there are product lines like, you know, to be honest with you for most often we don't, I, I would say we do not test apparel because there's no point in it because the fashion will be so in and out. We would waste more money testing it than we would putting it out and discounting it and disposing yep. of it after, after, you know, in serious. Now, that being said, like you were talking about doing a plus size study, right? Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about a significant shift in sizes, in styles, in shape, in all kinds of things that affect everything about what you're making and its effectiveness at selling in the marketplace, those are important trends to pay attention to. Absolutely. But the yeah. little trends of like, do we want a blue shirt or a Doesn't pink have shirt? A belt or not. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, these, I mean, specifically for that one, um, there, there are tons of influences happening culturally, politically, celebrity, you know, that stuff hits 
not just apparel, but many product lines. When you have the Kardashians on Instagram selling products, things are changing quickly. <laughs> Yeah. So now here's an interesting thing. So I was talking about that. I'm curious about your thoughts of it. So I read this article about how Kim Kardashian's doing her new, her own line. Mm -hmm. And she's doing her own line because she got sick of hawking other people's lines because they weren't, they did they weren't good enough or they weren't, um, they didn't really meet her needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought that that's really an interesting trend happening and we see it more and more because I do get a lot more celebrities who contact us and, you know, are looking for that kind of thing for doing their own label. Yep. And it used to be that in order to do their own label, all they did was take the regular one and slap their name on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, and so we, they got, like, I guess it, we stepped up into this place at which influencer shift was, I'm just going to show this off. I don't even have to stick my name on it because my name being associated with it is good enough. I don't and have now, to do ads. I don't, you know, yep. I don't have to do all this work. Well, so I'll that'll say. be, yeah, I'll make more money this way and it'll be easier on me. Mm -hmm. But it gets to a stage at which what's happening is, is that actually the celebrities aren't making enough money at it. The brands aren't getting enough value for it, and it's actually starting to fall apart. And so now these celebrities are going in. But what I'm really concerned about is that they aren't doing the good research behind it, no. and they don't really understand. They, they're like, I have a million followers. Well, how do you understand who the ones that are going to buy out of that million followers? Who's going to convert? Who's going to care? And do you really understand what they want? Because, you know, yeah, I pay yeah. attention to you, but, you know, you've got millions of dollars and your value is very different than my value. And it's not just the cost of the product, it's what the product does for me, right? Definitely, I mean, that's the, when you see the, the influencer selling products, it's very easy to get your 30 million subscribers to buy it once. Yeah. Are you gonna make enough money to sustain that business with the one-time buy? I don't know, every product's different, but that is what they run into. There's not, yeah, they have an established brand and everything they do, their followers will listen and do as they say. But most of the time, that's not enough to sustain a brand, to sustain a product on a shelf. Um, I mean, you see that a lot with the perfumes. Yeah. So whenever um, a celebrity comes out with their perfume, there's a new one every year because people aren't buying Britney Spears' curiosity anymore. Yeah. They're buying her new stuff every year, but that original one is done. You know, what's so interesting is what we don't, what we don't survey enough of at big brands and anywhere is customer attrition. Mm -hmm. Why someone didn't buy mm -hmm. or why someone was buying and now stops buying. So I, I saw this really interesting video with Isabella Rossellini, who I absolutely adore. Mm -hmm. um, she's amazing and beautiful and smart and all of these things. And she used to, when I was yeah, much younger, um, she was, um, the representative for, uh, for Trezor, the perfume line Trezor, which is, um, Lancome, right? Lancome, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so she was their representative and it was like, and I, you know, that product, that, that company was kind of, to me, like my mom's company, like it was mm -hmm. old to me at the time, but she made it, she made it young and she made it relevant. She made it, she gave it this quirkiness that I like mm -hmm. appreciated about. It. And I thought, well, how, if they can pre, they can put someone on there who's not like photoshopped perfect, like, you know, this was early Photoshop days, but yeah. you know, Photoshop perfect, then, then wow, that brand has some values in it that I like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she hit actually my age right now. Yeah. And they dumped her. Yep. And so, you know, so we were, I was like, how could they do that? She's still beautiful. She's still funny. She's amazing. No and, they, and they told her that she was no longer relevant to their audience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but they just recently asked her back and she said, and she said to them, um, I would like to meet with you. And she said, because I want to make sure that you don't think I'm still in my 40s because I have aged since the last time you saw me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I want to make sure you don't think that you're getting that woman because I'm yeah. different now. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so when she met with the, the new woman CEO of, of Lancome, they, they said, you, we made a mistake. We didn't understand that what our brand stood for and we understand it differently now. And we mm -hmm. look at it as a more expansive brand and you represent that. Mm -hmm. And by bringing you back, um, we believe that it, it's a statement to say we can make a mistake and we can fix it. And I guarantee you that came out of research. <laughs> That's right. They, they were doing some groups and some women in there were like, 
what the heck happened? Yeah. This why is why I dumped you. Have, yeah. Right? What, what, why? And they don't, they didn't have an answer. I mean, right. They, and so it's know, a great thing to ask why not, right? <laughs> yes. Why not? Or why did you change or what happened? How do we get you back? Yeah. Um, is it even possible to get you back? Sometimes your, 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 the world changes and your consumer changes as well. And yeah. you're going after someone different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, but not asking doesn't help you. No. Doesn't help you understand that. Doesn't help you capture that. So that is a really good thing. Like, I think that there is a case of what I call buying under duress because mm -hmm. there's no other options and you got to have something like, it's yeah. like, you know, you hate all the laundry detergents out there. Um, but you're going to buy, you buy this one. Why? Cause it's the cheaper one or it's this, you know, or mm -hmm. it has, it's, you know, it doesn't smell as you know, fruity as the other ones, like whatever yeah. it might be is your yeah. like criteria, but you could care less. Like if a new one came out tomorrow, you'll check it out. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you buy under duress because you got to have something. Yeah. But the minute something new comes along that might've solved that problem, you're going to test it. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so that's where opportunity lies. So you got to find out what that is. What is that critical factor? Well, and that's Market research. Story. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and those are the stories that you, that you hear as much as we hate focus groups. And by the way, there's so many other ways than a focus group to get that story, exact story of yeah. what you just said, that boredom, the, uh, I guess, you know, someone just saying, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I'll buy it. Is that how you want people to feel about your brand? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to, we're going to wrap up here because you're going to deep dive into so many of these subjects on here and I'm super excited. So everyone, I know you have lots of questions for Laura, so make sure that you go through the platform, send an email, message us, let us know what you'd like or join into her next office hours because they're going to be great. And, and, you know, be, I think one of the significant things you should cover is the timing when you should do some of these things. Um, we sort of touched on that here a little bit in sort of the process, but timing I think is such a critical factor for many people. It's like, am I ready yet? Is it too soon? Is it too late? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to get a lot of questions on that. Um, and so that's a good reason to join in live and ask Laura those questions. Like, yeah, am I time right? Yeah. And your ask questions. questions. We'll be phrased totally fine. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, no intimidation. You're asking no. a professional a person who develops questions, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> totally fine. I'm here to answer. I can also answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, and so anyway, so make sure you participate. Make sure you do that. Um, there is, just want to make everybody aware, I keep saying this on every video, but I want to make sure that everybody's aware that there's a tab in Lara's expert profile in the experts section. And that tab will have all of her videos as she records them. They'll be added into that area, mm -hmm. new ones all the time. And so um, we want to make sure that, you know, hey, if you want to deep dive into market research, go ahead and watch a ton of videos. Binge watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yep. We're all used to that, right? Binge watch, get some background and then set up an appointment with her if you need to. That you can do as well. You can reach out to her email. All her information on how to contact her is right there in the expert profile and reach out to her and find out because I have to tell you, and I'm not, not you know, not to sell it, not to just sell her, but I mean, seriously, her, her pricing is really useful. And the amount of, I mean, it's, it's low for the amount of money it could save you for making a mistake. And so Thank just to things. not budget for that is a mistake. So that's also something else. If you're planning your launch, have a chat with her about what she, she, she thinks you need. Like, do you need a moderated panel? Do you just need a survey? Like what is best for you? Because you want to plan that into your budget and spend it at the right time. So make sure you save for that. So those are great questions to reach out to her for. So. Thank you. Yeah. I am here, whatever you need. Um, and like I said, every product has its own nuance. So I think a conversation one-on-one -on -one can be very valuable. We can, we can set an action plan. Wonderful. So thank you all for listening and watching and tune in to uh, Laura's next office hours. Thank you guys. <laughs>